I mean, it's
Anybody on? Thirty-four. We're good. We're good. Yeah, if you guys have to, you have to take that on somebody's <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, has yeah. raised her hand. My responsibility oh. is to give you my grades. What's that? Okay. And any What's old that? Did you just make the new packet? Yeah, I've been looking at it online. I look at it at my home. The final one? I look at it at home. I don't need to download it. Long road. I need to remember the. Sometimes I'll download it at home, but a lot of times I just. Ask. You know, I look on a line and I don't look at it for not with Wi Fi. So I I'm just to keep, I never done. Some of the stuff they just talk about that's makes just me so curious. Mm -hmm. Not that I disagree with any of it, it. it's just no. curiosity. Yep. I'd like to call to order the Town of Breckenridge work session for the Town Council for Wait. October 26th. <laughs> We're going to begin with uh, Planning Commission decisions for the 19th. Any questions or anything for staff? I have a question. With the conversation about solar panels and how shiny they are, is there a chance we could see a photo? I don't want to call it up. I'm just, sometimes we read all about it, but then we don't get a chance to see what, what they're looking at. The Planning Commission looked at some um, material samples of that and felt pretty uh -huh. comfortable that it wasn't as reflective as maybe one of those photos indicated in the packet. Here. Okay. Could we see a material? I mean, I, again, I don't want to call it up. I'm just curious about it because. Yeah, I think we've got them upstairs. We could probably bring them by. Yeah, that's fine. I just. So you could take a look at them. It seems neat. Like I, I totally agree with the direction and everything. I just, I'm curious. Could you bring them by our house? <laughs> I'd like Actually, to get some panels, for my garage. <laughs> install them before I connect them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, anything else on planning? Oh. Will there be any call ups this evening? Do we need to talk about that now? Well, I'd like the staff to know so they can be here for them. Yeah. Okay. If you're, if you're planning on even discussing calling it up, they need to know so they can be prepared. Yeah, I think the BGV warrants a discussion. Okay. You'll be back. Thank you. Be here. All right, we move to legislative review. We start with a call up hearing procedures for second reading. Tim. Uh, this is mine. This ordinance revises in its entirety the development code rules governing call ups by the planning commission and the town council. Uh, kind of long overdue, I think. Uh, there are no changes to the ordinance from first reading. Any questions for Tim? Are we going to be having any housekeeping measures on your last night? Uh, no, I'm sorry, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> All right, GoCo grant support resolution. Hello, Mayor and Council. So Open Space is working with engineering and housing, um, trying to secure grant funding for the rec path extension through the McCain property. Starting first with the Alta Verde, we'd like to phase this um, so that we can get GOCO excited and stretch this out um, over the course of the development that's happening there. Um, so we are hoping to apply um, by the end of the year for this first phase, which will just connect from the existing rec path through Alta Verde and out to the river. Um, hopefully a future phase will connect along the newly restored river corridor. Um, all of this under the community impact grant category with GOCO. We're thinking of a possible third round under the restore category for the 15 acres of open space to actually restore that as well. So we'd love to, to see support in securing this grant. Yeah. Excellent. Any questions? Free money, sure. <laughs> will the match be yeah, that's what I half a million? It, exactly. Um, GOCO is, is really looking for at least 50% match on these projects. So we're asking up to 500,000. It'll probably be 500,000 that we ask for. Um, it's an expensive project just for the crossing and everything involved there. Excellent. Cool. Other questions? Thank you. Thanks. And a resolution to approve an MOU for the opioid settlement. Yeah, that's me. Um, prior to the pandemic, you all and nationwide were dealing with the opioid epidemic. And it's my understanding that Tim talked to you, Tim Berry talked to you quite some time about the federal litigation, the multi-district litigation. 
It's been going on for a couple of years and resulted in a settlement that is with the big three pharma and uh, distributors, the manufacturers and distributors. We, um, state and locals, spent uh, the better part of the past year negotiating the MOU that's in your packet and some associated agreements that will result in funds being distributed based on a percentage throughout uh, counties. And what we, we, we don't have a specific number that the town of Breckenridge will receive, but we estimate somewhere around 78,000 um, to be used. It, it, the way the funds can be used is constrained pursuant to the judicial decree. And if you have any other questions, please let me know. Do you know if all the other communities are, were um, going for this and will be awarded? It's my, there were a few um, cities in the state of Colorado that wanted to opt out and, and um, attempt to pursue state yeah. litigation. But in the MLD litigation, the federal courts were forcing um, other jurisdictions to join in the MLD. So I don't think anyone ended up pursuing. I know there were attempts, but I don't think okay. there were successful. Attempts. Hoping everybody in Summit's doing this. Oh. <laughs> but I'll double check. I have a manager's meeting on Thursday. Okay. I'm just curious because I think the deadline to get it a done lot of money. Yeah, there's a deadline because the money could come July 2022. Yeah. Liz in the uh, Oxy lawsuit, Oxycontin? It, well, it's the manufacturers and distributors of opioid um, pharmaceuticals. Okay. Huh. Friends, guys? Oh, um, <laughs> like them, Jeffrey. Yeah. <laughs> what, what happens to the one I mean, to me, $78,000 isn't even putting one person in rehab. No, but it, yeah, but we would probably combine our money countywide to look at some, I'm sure some sort of either education or treatment type services. So. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming this would be difficult to challenge it. We don't have a lot to say. I mean, it looks like they had an army of lawyers write it. Yeah. 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 Well, so what you are approving is actually an agreement of how the funds will be distributed that some decision was made along the way that um, we would join in that negotiated settlement. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No. No. You all right with that, Ted? Yeah. I mean, 78 grams seems like a... A lot of hands out for this money. Yeah. So lots of places. We must be at that last of what it, Yeah, I mean, the reality of it is we had multiple deaths in this community from opioids in the last five years, so it's a very tragic situation. So your point is valid, Dennis. It's uh, this is a big deal. It's uh, but I don't see much of a path of success in going down the road. And hopefully, a lot of money I I would imagine go to families and um, loved ones. I mean, yes, that's the way the money is intended to be spent, and and it may not be the end of it. This might just be yeah. the beginning of the settlements because this is intended to three big <sighs> distributors. But we could see more settlements along the way and more litigation that we can join. Yeah, this thing has layers. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, public projects update. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't have anything to add, but I'm happy to take questions about any of the projects going on. Questions? Are you going to be sad when the garage is done? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it's been a long, long, long project. We've gotten a ton of compliments on it. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Naysayers are thinking it looks really good. Good. Who's going to be here for Wake Up Breck and the ribbon cutting on the garage on the 11th? Uh, you won't be. You know. Where are you going to be? I don't know. But I'll probably be here. Are uh, you still here? We'll have uh, the only ones missing are going to be Kelly and Dennis. Uh -huh. Okay. Save me a mug. Are you still doing mugs on top of the ribbon cutting? Yeah. So what will happen is they'll want you there at 7 a.m. <laughs> behind garage? the town hall. Oh, yeah. town hall. Well, We'll be back there at the plaza area at Not 7 a.m. Yeah. And uh, we'll be coordinating. So as soon as 7.30 hits, we'll do yeah. uh, some, we'll say a few things. We'll cut the ribbon, and then we'll go. You'll each go to a table with some VR staff to hand out. 
Oh, they're not doing it at coffee shops this year. No, we're going to do it in conjunction with this, and each mug will be stuffed with a, uh, a uh, hundred dollar bill. It allows them to go to a specific shop and get a free cup of coffee that day oh. and well, free okay. parking. And we're doing free parking right on <coughs> that day. Mobility's handing out rec bags, and the vaccine bus from CDPHE will be in the lot. Wow. Look at that. Well done. Somebody and there'll be uh, their food and beverage will do pancakes. I mean, waffles. Oh, I was more excited about pancakes. Mm. Uh, does the CDPHE bus do booster? Uh, I would have to ask. I'm not sure if they're doing boosters or not. I'll find mm. out. Yeah, it's signed up for the school, but I'd rather get it in a bus. Are you yeah. doing it at Upper Blue? Yeah. Yeah, but I thought it was AM. It turned out it was PM. That's... Yeah. Are you able for a booster? I'm a front facing employee, dude. Oh, that's right. That's I right. shake a lot of hands. Yeah, good point. Yep. Yep. Anything else for public projects? Mobility is the old parking and transit. We call it mobility now. I like that. Yeah. Progressive. Yeah. <clears throat> Progressive. <laughs> I threw in some pictures there. Um, Hyder did not get me a, one of the weekly reports. So that was my version of an update there with some photos. Picture of anything Shannon says goes. It looks awesome. They erased that a long time Anything ago. for Shannon? Oh, they're over <laughs> there. <now. laughs> They knew they were on track. They let it go. <laughs> it has been great. Will they be there? Yeah. Good. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty excited. Good. Mm -hmm. I'd like to introduce them and thank them. Yeah, I uh, I gave Doug from Hyder opportunity if he wanted to take it to say thank you to some of the subcontractors because there's been a really great team of a lot of local people as well. So I'm hoping he could, he'll do a little shout out. Okay. If not, I can give you a little list. Good. That'd be great. Uh, all right. Thank you. Right. Housing and child care. Anything to update on? <coughs> child care next week. So yeah. nothing right now. We, had, we did housing last week. Yeah. Last kids week. were all on break this week anyway. So yeah. The parents had to take care of their own kids this week. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's unbelievably hard to <laughs> committees. <laughs> the summit stage report if any questions on that i think everybody knows they're cutting back their routes oh i know i did have a question about the middle a ton of the middle school kids are riding the summit stage to get to the middle school is are they making sure that it still is going to pick up and drop off at the right time to get those kids from like up on uh blue in blue river and <coughs> a bunch of the kids up on from the meeting last month in the meeting last month that they mentioned that um a lot of the kids were riding the summit stage over swan mountain to the high school but they didn't mention anything to the middle school so i'm not sure the boreas pass kids are all that entire bus is full with middle school kids and i can find out what time that bus is i don't have one on there but yeah let us know because matt's going to be at the summit stage meeting tomorrow morning okay terrific what are we trying to make sure that they're just that they're cognizant of the time so that those yeah so they don't yeah. drop the bus that picks all the kids up and gets yeah. them all there in time for school you got that okay thanks so much yep all right events uh, anything else besides what is in the memo and this is from the first meeting the meeting in october on october 6th since we didn't put it in the packet for the retreat and we have a meeting next week. Okay. Um, I would like to make sure that when we talk about Brecktoberfest, that there is a special emphasis on um, business. the businesses on Main Street that are directly affected by the Oktoberfest. Because if we're just putting out um, a survey, I wanna make sure that, that it's a, more of a door-to-door -door on Main Street. Because I heard a lot of approval of what happened this year. Um, so I'd like well, to, from the businesses. Yep. You mean to ask them if they want it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, they you know, want it in the same configuration as this year. Right? Uh, some of the people I talked to liked it this way. Yeah, that's what I, you know, me too. just as busy, if not busier and less obtrusive. Nobody I think business wise. I, it was solid. It was a good weekend, but I heard a ton of 
um, frustration over the desire to have the old one back. Yeah. Just for character of community type yeah. type. Of course, none of those people have to deal with people puking in their restaurants and yeah, retail yeah. Yeah, during me, it. I... So, so the second phase of that is if we're going back down that road, the BTO must do a better job of controlling the event. Yes. I mean, that's just has to be how it is. There, there, this cannot just be back to where it was two years ago or three years ago when it was just, I mean, honestly, Saturday's mayhem. Yeah. You cannot go back to that configuration. So, you know, once I don't, I don't disagree with that, but I, I, I did not hear a lot of positive from community members on this year. So. Yeah, and I did. I, I did from all the merchants. What I heard, a lot of the merchants, at least from Lucy, is that the events committee will talk about it, and then we'll have a chance to talk about it, and then the survey will go out. Okay. We'll talk about it before the survey goes out. That's yeah. That, from what I understand, Shannon, is that what you heard? I too? think um, I emailed back and forth with Lucy today. I think she's going to be reaching out to you all to get some feedback from you individually. And then there is an intent to do a survey of Main Street and then um, sort of like Dick said, balance or try to figure out some kind of balance between what the community is looking for, what the what is the merchants are looking for. And what you all feel about the event, so. Yeah. And I think um, I think that's smart because we also in the survey we don't want to offer up something that this group is not willing to give. So and I also think from a safety standpoint, I mean Eric's point's good. That that may be where the balance is is stronger control of it because it's a a little bit of an unwieldy weekend. It's the way it was in the past. I mean Saturday is really the day that Saturday. Gets out of hand. Saturday yeah. Good enough. All right. Anything else on events? All right, ADU changes under planning matters. Mark. Thank you, Eric. Uh, a few months ago, the Planning Commission and Council had a joint meeting. And one of the items we talked about was accessory dwelling units and the potential for units that aren't designated as accessory dwelling units to serve as short-term rentals, kind of like those banded apartments, things like that. So the code changes that are in front of you in the memo from Julia kind of overview some of the changes we're proposing there. So some of these, um, some of the items are to kind of tighten down on the definition of an ADU to avoid the situation where you know, you've got the, it looks like a rec room or an art studio, but it could be easily converted into an ADU or becomes one. And that's been a continuing concern, I know, of the Planning Commission. Um, in addition to that, we also have an incentive piece in here for projects that do want to, you know, include an ADU as part of their construction um, or propose it on their own where they can get positive points for it. So, um, the memo outlines the changes in more detail. I'm not going to go into those at this point in time, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have about them. So would it be possible, and I, I'm sure that there's a reason why for this, but would it be possible that if, if people are going down the employee housing route that they would be allowed an oven? Yeah, if, you, if you're willing to restrict it as an ADU, you can have full kitchen, oven, everything. Okay, great. Okay, great. That, I that takes a deed restriction. Yeah, yeah, great. Fantastic. Otherwise, you get a small wet bar. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Which, Tiny. I, it was a little unclear to me little. which which direction we were heading on the size limitation of the wet bar. Okay. Do we decide to limit the size or not? Thank you, Dick. And that's one outstanding thing. We were looking for some input from you on. The Planning Commission was kind of split on that. Uh, you know, the wet bar in these larger homes, there's definitely a lot of entertainment and some of them that goes on. And so they um, sometimes they'll propose some fairly large wet bars. Um, so we've heard, you know, from the architects, et cetera, that we would like to see an opportunity to have a larger one. Now, um, we put in here 10 square feet as a limitation, you know, which is like five by two, three, three by three, a little more than that. In, in size. Um, so um, 
but we're looking for your input on that if you feel that's necessary to have a limitation on the size of the wet bar or not. I do know that the county has a limitation right now, and theirs is pretty small, it's six square feet. Yeah, I think six might be a little small. For me, it's the larger homes that tend to do a lot of these ADUs. So I, to me, it kind of makes sense. Which way, Dick? To have, have a limitation. All right, so. I don't know the number. I mean, I think I would rely on staff who looks at this stuff all the time to, to recommend a number. But are you okay with 10 square feet? Yeah, I mean, that seems to be reasonable. Wet area they calculate, like the sink and... The sink, cabinets, countertops, anything associated with it. To mark it down, stand it right. The larger homes want a bigger wet bar, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what the architects are telling us. I would it make sense to... to do it by square feet? Not square feet of wet bar, but square feet of house? Right. You could. I'd be okay. Oh, go ahead. Go I ahead. wouldn't support the size limit. That sounds really small as is. And if our intent is truly to limit ADUs, I don't know how much limiting design from a sense of limiting the size of the wet bar would factor into prohibiting ADUs. I think a lot of elements in this code as written um, accomplish that. So um, I wouldn't support the size limit. Well, it doesn't limit A to use. It limits it to be the wet bar. off as a separate, a separate room, a separate uh -huh. rentable room really is what it is outside of the ADU. But so shouldn't we be able to, I guess my confusion is, shouldn't we be able to, um, is our, concerned that they would have two separate like they would live in the smaller area and or they would live in the bigger area and rent short-term rent the smaller area but couldn't we limit that with the license mm -hmm. i mean i guess this feels like a reasonable attempt to do something but and i know that in the past we've said we don't really have the enforcement to go checking on things but I feel really strongly that we're trying to go the direction to have the enforcement. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a more reasonable. That's only thing. if they get a license too. Yeah. So. But aren't know, we also checking for bandit? Well, yeah, but what if they're just using it? I mean, technically they can't be building a, an ADU that they use for a mother in law suite either, right? No, you can't. So, yeah, it has to be. I mean, they can't build a separate area that you know that to use for a mother-in-law or any other type of use that wouldn't even require a short-term rental mm -hmm. my understanding is that it's one short-term license for the whole home right so i don't know how we'd monitor that but you can see they wouldn't need to apply for another one essentially mm -hmm. yeah you could see from the pictures though in the description in well the yeah if it was just a one bedroom in a 20 bedroom yeah. house you'd know right if we if we had that kind yeah. of enforcement that that ability to have which i which i would like to see too because then you would be able to see oh this is just a room in that big house and it's the adu so that might be covered that way if yeah. i don't know how we get to that yeah for compliance i mean we're having enough compliance issues right now with things that are pretty simple i mean unless you're gonna we're gonna have a big compliance squad grinding this info out that's gonna be really difficult to catch i think yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a matter. I think it's a matter of resources. But yeah, right. So I think what we need to do as a council is set it up so that the code prohibits the majority of them, and then you don't have a ton that you have to catch. Right. And I like Dennis's idea of doing it based on doing it based on size. So can I just? play devil's advocate for a second. You always do. Why, why, <laughs> would, you ask, why would you ask this time? Not always. Okay. But like, <laughs> but what if there was somebody who wanted to long-term rent this, this portion, but without it, but they didn't want a deed restriction on it. Is that, do you think that there's any population that would want to do that? Well, there's a lot of population that wants to do that, but we just, know that you know we you might have one great person who builds the house and does all the right things and long-term rents to someone 
who's in the community and then they sell the property and yeah right the right thing we know it's- I'm just worried it, like I'm just wondering I guess that that's my argument for relying more heavily on enforcement rather than I don't, yeah, I don't know I, I I just feel like they're deterred that that will be deterred too by this it, well, it's something to consider especially because this is mainly on new construction and we're about to have a cap in yeah. a week yeah so does that take care of a lot of the concerns anyway i mean i i feel like it's I like, would be in favor of allowing somebody to do this. If they don't deed restrict, though, they don't get anything free. Right. So you provide a unit, but you don't provide anything in exchange. If you don't deed restrict it, you don't get fees waived. You don't get water waived. Right. The only reason we would put any treasure into it is if you put a deed restriction on it. Yeah, but then that's yeah. the opposite of what you just said, right? Is that then we're allowing them to build it? And hoping they do the right thing. We're allowing them to build it and hope they do the right thing because they can build it right now. First of all, this is all in unlimited density areas. This is places they could build these rooms anyway. I mean, it's not like it's not like they can't. You know, the only challenge with that, Eric, is impacts of the neighborhood. You know, it's a whole nother unit. And um, that many more cars, that much more traffic, that much more um but you're allowing it as an adu so what's the difference i mean we hope there's no traffic because we're be getting something rental. for it then you know but we're, we'd be getting we something could. for it if somebody was just renting it to a local anyway yeah but i my, my concern is that they're going to short term it if we just let them do it they gotta, have, they gotta get a law. license though and that they can't do today i mean they won't be able to do it if they're building this house you know starting next week I mean, they'll be able to eventually, but you know the the licenses will be more I difficult. See, see what I'm saying? And they yeah. won't be able to. They won't be able to short term rent it to two different entities at the same time, yeah. right? So, like, no matter how you cut up the house, well, you could. You that we that we will have a really hard time doing compliance on. For one license for each one. Yeah, that's not gonna. We we're just to. not. It's just too. I mean, that's a ton of data. To grind through and currently we just you know we just look to see that everybody's got a license right now i mean i we we don't look to see if there's the only way that show up is if that license showed up twice once yeah. as a one bedroom and once right. as a five bedroom and it would have to right like that's that's uh, how they would have to be able yeah. to do yeah. it mm-hmm. is to advertise it as two different like two different units and they would have to have two different licenses. well theoretically i don't know right now if you have can you use the same license for multiple units and nobody knows yeah. Well, maybe like that's maybe that's can, a problem that's we need to around. solve anyway. Um, so anyway, I guess the long and the short of it is, I'm switching my mind as far as whether we should have a limitation on it. I think, um, I think if we have a limitation to the wet bar, then we are we're not allowing a long term renter in there without a deed restriction. Without a deed restriction, right? Like you take away that possibility because you can't have a hot plate. You can't. You you probably don't have enough room for any kind of things that you. Anyway, that's that's where my brain is landing right now. I, mean, I don't think this. Uh, I mean, I, to Eric's point, I you know I think if if we're going to allow them, then we should just allow them. I don't think the size restriction on the on the wet bar is gonna is gonna uh, you know if that's not gonna be the deciding factor whether somebody you know leases long term without a deed restriction or not. That's something I I might need to think about a little bit more. Now we can see why the planning commission struggled with this. Yeah, deed restriction also requ- it does require that it's filled right yeah mm-hmm. See, that's, is that i think that is a part of the difficulty but at the same time i think if we i'm struggling a little bit i think same as dick and just thinking like okay so now we're just going to allow adus and they can be open i think that is going to be an impact to the neighborhood because i think a lot of people are going to have people coming up every weekend from denver to stay whether they're renting it or not I do think that's going to change the use. 
it's going to be an attractive thing, even if they don't have a short-term rental license, it's going to be used like a short-term rental license with, mm. you know, from friends and things. Right. So I, I wouldn't, I feel like we need to think about that before we but just move forward with the kitchen anyway, the main kitchen. Yeah, really. Well, right? All you're deciding right now is do you want to limit the size of the web bar? <laughs> we have gone away down. Well, yeah except there's there's more to it than what there the is but planning yeah. commission's been talking about i mean this is a bigger discussion than just the wet bar honestly yeah, i'm change direction on that, I think, a little bit yeah i don't know why this is so hard i'm still a no limit on size i don't think that element is enough of a deterrent either way to change a adu sdr so i'm a no, not. Mark, uh, general question. When you talk to them, think it's great to move ADUs as class D um, developments to streamline the process. Is that if someone's bringing on an ADU, if it's a new build, it's going through the full process, right? Can you explain that? Yeah, actually, I believe the way we have it written right now, and, we, and this is just a work session, so we, we want your input, um, is it would be associated potentially with a single family. So it could help that um get through the process but um we have to think about that because typically if something takes on negative points we're going to send it to the planning commission as a class c at a single family so that would be an exception but i believe the way it's worded right now that's what it says so mark does the um building department feel or the planning department feel that Limiting the size of the wet bar really does help it not become a rental. Like, do they feel like that's an effective thing to do? Just one of the tools to limit it more. It's not going to in itself make that huge a difference, probably, Kelly. I mean, two years ago, I, up, up until a couple of years ago, we did not even allow, <clears throat> excuse me, we allowed ADUs, but we didn't require a deed restriction or anything. And so then we did our comprehensive code amendments, maybe three now, Eric, right? Yeah. Um, years ago, we put that restriction in. Um, county had done that for several years, and we thought that was important to get that put in place so that we ensured that those units were being, you know, manage and use like like they were intended to be used so that's just a little backdrop on the you know why we have the deed restriction in the first place the one exception we made here we had um a, a year ago made some changes where we said if you have a detached structure and like a garage and you got a unit above it something above it a room it's habitable space. We it has to be considered an ADU, um, unless you don't bring water out there to the site. Uh, we got some pushback from that. So what we've changed our philosophy on that in here is we said you can do that, but you have to be willing to enter into a no short-term rental restriction because it wasn't so much about that we had to have an ADU. I mean, it's nice to get, but it's just, we didn't want it to right. become another short-term rental. Right. So um, that's kind of how we address that issue. So could we do that? Could we, if you're not gonna enter into um, that, the agreement to have no short-term rental, then you have to have the limited size wet bar. But if you will agree, if you will enter into the short-term rental, uh, no short-term rental agreement, then you can have as big of a wet bar as you want. Sure. Yeah, so if you were de-destruct it, you could have a huge wet bar. <laughs> hey, Mark, well, at no, that point, no you get a kitchen, actually. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, that's what you do get. Right. If you de-destruct, you get a kitchen, not a wet bar. Do you file, do you file that as a covenant on your property? Yeah, you can. Because then it would go have to go in perpetuity. If you want that next owner and everybody. Oh, would that's true. Yeah, that's the, it's the that's whole, an, that's, it's, cool. it's, the, it's the whole property, not the ADU, too. That's pretty unpopular. Yeah. Wildly unpopular. Yeah. I more I think about it, I'm I'm hesitant to uh to allow the ADUs without a deed restriction. I I, I think the impacts plus I think we're missing 
our opportunity to get these deed restricted, which provides workforce housing in perpetuity, which is really what we're trying to do. Yeah. So is that no yeah. wet bar? Are we talking about Back to the wet bar. Is, wait, I, yeah, how does that figure into? To me, the wet bar is insequential. Okay. You know, I can support it or not. I'm not going to fall my sword on that one. But to Eric's discussion about whether the, the unit should should have a deed restriction or not, I think it should. Well, I guess the question is, is it just deed restriction light? Is that? Yeah. Um, although based on the housing committee's recommendation, we're putting in... Um, a rental cap as well. So it's a little more than that. What's it at a hundred mark? I can't remember what, what I think it's was. 120 because that's 120? what it was in the Wellington, right? Yeah, I'll have to double check on that. I'm pretty sure it was 120%. 120, it's very reasonable. It's a very reasonable amount. Yes. Hey Mark, just, just to can people from putting up such a high rent on it that it never gets rented. Yeah. Well, and of course my problem with ADUs has always been Thing about them just not renting it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to, that's another thing, it's difficult to get yeah. compliance on and make sure that it's rented. Yeah. You could get the free stuff. You could do that. And then you could just have friends come up every weekend. I'm... But we need to figure that piece out for all kinds of reasons. We need a lot well, of Well, the our... general, general compliance on deed restriction lights in, in general, all over the community are hard to hard to enforce and that is something I think that's got to be a priority but it is always better it is always better if we can build the code so it's more difficult to do that because the compliance piece is always the hardest yeah help compliance for landscaping is hard you know and that's something we've dealt with forever and we've you know what I mean yeah. I mean they put landscaping and they, they tear it out the next year we don't do it you know mm -hmm. so this stuff becomes difficult if we create a code that makes it so you difficult have to for us to enforce and have compliance for. So your proposal is none of this without a deed restriction. What is that? What you're saying that no, no without a deed I, I think it's well written. I, okay. I, you know, what I'm hearing, Eric lobbying for is to get rid of the deed restriction requirement, which I'm no, not no, no. That well, only if you're. I'm just trying to circumvent the people that are going to short, you know, do this yeah. anyway, because what I don't want to do is give them water. Three in my neighborhood that I yeah. guarantee you're going to. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know, you know, I don't, you know, compliance is compliance. I, whether we require a deed restriction or not, those that are going to break the rules are going to still try right. to, I think. We can beef that up though, Eric, in terms of making sure that the deed restriction talks about that it has to be continuously occupied or they have to be making a good faith attempt to re-rent it if someone, you know, ends their lease, that type of thing. I mean, right now you can't say that nobody came to rent my space. Yeah, I would, yeah. <laughs> I think we need, yeah, the devil's in the details with that one about the good yeah. faith. So back to the question on the size. <laughs> I mean, Carol seems strong against, I, you know, I, I'm fine. Either way, I could. Hey, Mark, what does the county do for wet bars? There's Three. six square feet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's way too small. Carol with their wet bar with a diving board. So I, I don't think we should restrict this. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with it. Okay. But Mark, um, can we plan to like check back in and maybe six months and see if the planning commission feels like that has made a negative impact? Yeah, certainly we can. I don't know if six months is the right time frame. Maybe it's a year, but I feel like Dennis's uh, yeah, size, percentage. Uh, percentage of the room size. I think the percentage is a good good one because in you know in the historic district where the houses are smaller then they will be smaller and then in the highlands the highlands where the houses are bigger i thought this was only where density wasn't an issue but we currently have a penalty if someone is not abiding 
by the ADU policy or short-term renting. We're going to get stockades out in the Riverwalk <laughs> Park, <laughs> the Blue River Parkway, as soon as Tim's gone, because he was against that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we should talk about that tonight, since it's his last <laughs> <time>. <laughs> Unscathed, Tim. <laughs> Hanging, Judge. <laughs> I'd be in favor of the square footage. Oh, geez. Well, it's yeah. three to four. Well, where are you? You're the you're the tiebreaker. <laughs> no pressure. Um, Wild West, no rules or square footage. <laughs> no rules. All right, all right. No sides limit on a four to three split vote. Too often. Does that give you enough to come back with? Uh... Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, while you're here, let's talk about planning commission appointments. All right. Thank you. Um, we had five applicants. Um, and uh, we, of those, one rose to the surface. Um, we actually narrowed it down to three that we interviewed. And then um, of those interviews, George Swentz, um, our, in, our, in our interview panel was myself, Julia, and uh, Steve Gerard from the Planning Commission. We really like George. Um, and um, he brings some good experience to the table. I know. In talking with Jay Beckerman, he was really, you know, concerned about kind of that void potentially with Christy Matthews Lydell even having that planning experience that she brought to the planning commission. Uh, George actually has a degree in urban planning. He worked as in a planning department for several years and then went into the development business for a number of years in Colorado. He also was commercial broker of office space, stuff like that. Um, he brought definitely a probably a broader background than the other candidates were able to in terms of what we were looking for for the planning <laughs> commission. So we've made the recommendation um, that George be appointed, and that's obviously um, your guys' final call. So I'd be glad to answer any questions. I'm curious in general, there are three applicants, and I think in general, it's been a conversation among some of us, just the recruitment for commissions, everything. Is it typical that we get three, like in it was general? Five. There were five. Oh, five. They narrowed it down to three. Oh, got it. Um, but has there been a trend in people, less applicants or just in general on recruitment? I'd say five is, you know, decent for our recruitments, honestly. Okay. I'm not sure what we can do. I'm sure there are some things we can do PR wise to increase the awareness in the public out there. I mean, I made a few phone calls, stuff like that to people. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah. Uh, you know, one, one thing you could, you could do is interview all five applicants, even though, even if some don't seem to meet the, uh, Criteria. meet the criteria if, if someone if someone puts puts themselves out there they put their name out there i think you know and i know you guys are much busier than certainly than i am and i'll interview them uh I, I think uh we should give them the courtesy of interviewing them even if it's even if it's just i mean they they, they might they might uh shock you you know yeah I, I appreciate that jeffrey and i you know we did make that decision partly just because of how busy Potential. we were in that yeah. and we had yeah. interviewed both of the other others before but um you know i i take that as constructive advice in terms of maybe moving forward i i agree with that i also think that this would be a good thing for so, the social equity commission to look at i know when we recruited for the social equity commission we did a few different a few things differently like we had an application rather than submitting resumes things like that um, I'd love to see us have like a, a policy across all commissions and committees that um, is fair and equitable. But I think I think that's a great step too of just making sure everybody gets an interview. Unless there's just way too many people, but I I can't imagine that at this point. But yeah, I think it's something to look at. I would like the equity commission to look at this as well because this um, group is terrific and they've. You know they're doing great work and props to them because they spend a ton of time but even i mean in many ways it's not representative of our community so i think we need to really be making sure that we're looking at that in all of our commissions and 
how we can do a little bit more outreach to make sure that it's representative of who's who's making up our residents. that's cross all commissions you're i mean that's certainly on the social equities agenda right you know it's certainly on our radar good might be two processes because some are council appointed and some are right some are advisory only and some aren't but could be yeah. two and the, the topic came up when we were in park city uh you know anybody with DEI and then how they're trying to expand and where people typically might not be comfortable in those environments, right? So, yeah. But I, I do think it's up to us to, to remove those barriers and make sure that people can feel comfortable in this environment, that they can see themselves in, mm -hmm. in these committees and commissions. And I, I think we do things that we're not even aware of that is, you know, that are barriers. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a place where we can improve. With that said, I'm into Swint's. I'm glad he has that planning background. That's great. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Good choice. All right. Thank you. Hey, Eric, before uh, <clears throat> Mark leaves and we bring Jeannie down, we just want to give you a quick update on the a tourism overlay task force oh yes please so mark maybe you want to let them know who we who's committed to serving on this at this time sure so uh we've got abby brown and uh mike hessel from uh property managers we've got jim schlegel abby epperson and steve fisher from realtors uh at large devin o'neill Steve Gerard, Taja Greer, and uh, the fourth is Michelle Zimmerman. We're reaching out to her. We um, Beth Groundwater was top. She, she couldn't. She couldn't make it. So we're reaching out to Michelle. Still haven't heard back from her, but hopefully we'll have her in the fold as well. And then Bob Barto from the kind of exempt properties. Then Kelly and Dick are on the the council reps on that, and then a few of us staff will be involved. We have a meeting scheduled next Tuesday, November 2nd at nine o'clock, which will be our kickoff meeting. And I think Eric's going to come to say a few words to the group as well. Great. So we'll work with the group. Our intent is to meet um, more frequently, at the, certainly at the start of this. And I don't know if it'll be every week, but probably every other week at least at a minimum. So. So when's the meeting again? The first meeting, the second? Tuesday, the second. second. Any questions for staff? That went pretty well. You actually, the selection. Hmm. Thank you, Mark. Thank you guys for Thank jumping Mark. on it. Uh, do you want to do accommodation unit housing fee also, or who's handling? No, it? Uh, let's go. To okay, Jeannie, please. Summit Foundation, give like a local update. <laughs> Beverage. Oh, you can get drunk. You can you can pass it around. Can we pass stuff around now? Was it open? Yeah, we should give, it. <laughs> <laughs> give it to Tim Barry. How are you, Eric? That's nice. To be able to drink on the job. <laughs> I'm Jeannie with the Summit Foundation, and um, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to just give you an update on Give Like a Local. Uh, during the pandemic, when we had these Zoom calls, we talked about this issue in the community and you know, it's not, not just in the town of Brackets throughout Summit County, um, but we wanted to kind of talk about the fact that um, major donors are leaving our community and so, for the Summit Foundation itself, you know, we have almost 200 major donors that have left, you know, and that's throughout the county. And that's true of all of our nonprofits. So um, we're not yet seeing it impact our donations because, you know, as you all know, we're a generous community, but we want to kind of be proactive on that because people that are moving here, we want to make sure that they know that we are a giving community and that we volunteer 
and that we are philanthropic. We give back mm -hmm. to our community and we care about each other. And so the Summit Foundation is the lead organization on behalf of all of the nonprofits, really on behalf of all of us to connect with the new residents that are moving here and make sure that they know that we have that community value. Uh, one time Eric said something that just chilled me because, you know, as you know, the Summit Foundation's tagline is soul of the summit. And one time Eric said, we don't want to become a soulless community. <laughs> And it's like, wouldn't that be terrible um, that people moving here don't have that philanthropic value? So, so that's the problem that we're addressing. And like I said, um, you know, we don't, it's not bad yet, but we want to make sure it doesn't get bad. So we created a program, and again, on behalf of all of the nonprofits called Give Like a Local. And so there's a couple of components to the Give Like a Local program. Um, the first is this bottle of wine that you see. Um, Carboy actually made this wine for us. We're on the second batch now, and it's the soul of the Summit wine. And our board members bought this wine for the Summit Foundation. We're not spending your donations on wine, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but we decided, well, we have this wine, and so you know, what better way to welcome people than to um, kind of give them this bottle of wine? It has a hang tag, and you know, we're not going to ask them for money right away. We're going to say, you know, once you get settled, um, please know that this is a giving community. And so we beefed up our website. Um, we have volunteer opportunities from all of the nonprofits, and we're asking people to go onto our website to learn about how they can get involved and uh, working with all of our nonprofits on that. So rather than kind of just passing these out, we're building partnerships with uh, realtors, uh, realtors that are willing to work with us to give this wine away for free, uh, to welcome people that seem interested. And so, um, you know, that's one thing is we're looking for people to work with. If you guys know of anybody, if you know of any philanthropic realtors or any realtors that would be willing to do that. Um, we're also working with, you know, other entities that have contact with those new residents. I furnish, um, you know, designers, people like that, that can um, welcome people. And so that's one component of it. And then, um, like I said, getting that information out on the Summit Foundation website. And really, um, when people get in touch with us, you know, meeting with them and telling them about the community and trying to hear what their interests are. And because we know the community so well, we can connect them with those volunteer opportunities. And then the last component of the program is uh, marketing. And so we have trade agreements with both the Summit Daily News as well as the radio stations. And so you'll start hearing this campaign, Give Like a Local. And so it's just, you know, to get the word out, to have people thinking about that and just kind of have that be the buzz. And so um, Eric and I were talking about it and he thought you all might be interested in getting an update on the program because it's something that we're all concerned about. And so basically what we want, um, what we ask you uh, to do is just to help <laughs> us get that word out. And then let's think about ways that we could partner you know, because I know that you all are wanting to do some receptions for the new residents or, you know, kind of welcome, welcoming them to our community. And so let's make sure that we can uh, include philanthropy in that conversation. Thank you. Questions? When you say um, major donors are leaving, are they like leaving town or like dying? Oh, my. <laughs> I'm going to say leaving town. How's that? Yeah. Um, you know, because usually your major donors, not all of them are older, but some of, you know, many of them are older. And so they've had to leave for health reasons. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, I didn't... So, you know, yeah, leaving town, Jeffrey. Thank you. Oh, Jeffrey. <laughs> Have you had any feedback yet from new community members seeing the wine bottles or program and reaching um, out? Yeah, we've had really great feedback. Um, one of the components that I didn't mention was um, that the Summit Foundation is also hosting um, receptions for new residents. And so, you know, we had one over at the um, golf course this summer. And people loved it, you know, I mean, just that's a really great way for people to meet each other. 
And so that was a great thing for the Summit Foundation because we purposely told people we're not going to ask for a donation, but we still got donations. <laughs> so, so we've gotten great feedback and um, I think people really appreciate it. And like I said, it's just really launching. And so um, we're just now starting, I'd say that. Somebody mentioned that maybe we should have coffee. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We could have coffee too. <laughs> Any other questions? I think it's great. Okay. Kind of outreach we, we talked about. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank that. all of you. And yeah. thanks for your support for the community as well. Well, we if love. If we can partner in any other way, let us know because I, I agree. I think it's a great program. Okay. And it's very much needed. All right. We'll keep it in mind. Thank and you. For us too, because we want to connect with them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> hey, we're going to take a quick sure. five minutes and then we'll come back for the uh, accommodation unit housing fee.
Uh, accommodation unit housing B, Rick. So I want to spend a little time with you, kind of getting you up to date to uh, where we're at and what we're planning, what my recommendation is as uh, Kirsten and I work over the next week and putting together an ordinance that our plan is to bring to you at the first meeting in November. So uh, currently the we have what uh, an accommodation unit administrative fee. You're all familiar with that, right? So we have the bolt license that people pay for and the uh, administrative fee. So our recommendation is that we would repeal that administrative fee and enact a new fee that we will bring to you based on our study um, to generate the funds that would go towards uh, the same things the old one did, housing, uh, development, and, and, uh, and what was the parts of that, Kirsten, in there? Enfor enforcement. Enforcement. Personnel, yeah. staff, time enforcement, yep. So we just don't think that it makes sense to have two different administrative fees. Okay. Is everybody going to be with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and the other strategy where I need some discussion and feedback from you is that we feel that this fee should be applicable to all accommodation units. So we define an accommodation unit as that type of any unit that rents out for money, a, a period less than 30 days. So those are our short term rentals. So feel that it is, um, you know, based on the, um, the it, it's a user type fee based on the people using those facilities and their average spend, the, um, you know, the money that is spent in town that generates retail, restaurant, all of those things, then you requires workers in order to service those things, correct? And so, um, it makes no reason, th nothing makes sense as to why we would exempt certain properties from that, doing that. And so this would be applicable to all. And we're going to ask them to, uh, whatever that full number is that the study comes up with, they would mitigate 35% of that, which is the standard that we currently use in our commercial linkage that we passed about a year and a half ago. So. So we'll come up with a fee and they actually pay 35% of the, the we come up with That's an cool. impact number and then the fee is 35% of the impact number. Yeah. That's the policy that we that, yeah. would put in okay. the ordinance. And that ties directly to that. That's what we came up right. last year. And I also, um, I think we need to repeal that policy. Is it 24 or yeah. that deals with the commercial linkage mitigation? Because our consultants feel strongly that that's double dipping the same. So if we're getting, if we're paying on the user in, we shouldn't be charging that same restaurant to build developer. housing because yeah. we're collecting money to build housing for that restaurant employee. Right. So, ah, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, Interesting. so we're going to put the burden on paying the impact fee on the lodging community. Not an impact, yeah. though. So, well, it, not, all the lodging not an impact fee, not. Uh, but what? But I mean, never mind. I see. A user fee? Yes. Because, like, it's really on the people who are coming to use the services, then they'll be paying for the employees who are going to be taking care of them. And so, so it does track back. And EPS really did a thorough analysis. I mean, they looked at this every way. And every time we asked a question, they would never answer <laughs> on that day. You know, they would always say, we'll get back to you next week. So they really looked at this with should we be treating exempt and non-exempt the same? Should we, you know, how does this 
commercial part fit into the whole equation? I mean, they've looked at it and this is the way they suggest that we should be moving forward with it. So would this also affect hotels then too? Yes. Okay, I think, okay. Yeah, I withdraw what I just said. So if we repeal 24R, the employee mitigation, it would just be in relation to accommodation units, mm -hmm. not for other types of development. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> so you recommended that we repeal in the code, I think it's 24R, the employee yeah. mitigation. So that would just apply if this was an accommodation unit, not if it was a restaurant coming in. No, it would they apply would. to all restaurants too. Oh. Any commercial linkage, any commercial business that we currently require them to mitigate 35% uh, of the employees generated by that business, we would uh, not have that. Hmm. So the grocery store or anything, because that's all part of the overall spending pattern of guests. Huh. They're going to grocery stores and right. If our guests, here's a theory. If the guests didn't go to a grocery store, then you would need less employees in the grocery store because they would be servicing far fewer people, correct? And so it all, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's a gas station, whether it's a restaurant or a retail shop, it all goes into those, that a, average daily spend of each guest to those. And then that that's part of the formula that I can't set here. That's, I mean, that's what we hired them to defend. Mm -hmm. And then they look at the at the amount of people it takes to service that, and then they come up with the the difference between the average cost today of a housing in our area, uh, and the difference between market and uh, what it costs us to build uh, workforce <coughs> housing, and then that's that's the gap that they have to come up with towards each employee and come up with that number. What about entities that have already paid or already fell under 24R? Um, or are there any? I don't know. Well, I don't know if there's any new ones that would fall into that, but um, again, there, um, in, in, we have units that have built housing. Yeah for various reasons in the past but that wouldn't come into play okay it just wouldn't okay. well because they built they built housing to mitigate the employees that they hire under those old ones versus right. um yeah, but moving forward one. every year for every unit they would pay this fee right they Still. would yeah i mean if they have an str license everybody now that has an str license that currently is required under the code to get a license would also be required to pay this administrative fee. But I thought you were saying also if, if they're a hotel, right? Or a lodging accommodation? Well, I'm not, but a, a typical hotel is not, is, is I believe licensed as a commercial property and not required to have an STR license mm -hmm. because the Marriott. Uh, so okay, it's so all now, individually owned. So says now, a, uh, confused so it's so hotels are not paying this mm -hmm. a condo hotel is the beaver run of the world okay, okay but like New like world. the marriott like or well i guess are they short which one the residents in it's two <laughs> different there's a marriott down by where you Re residents, residents in. in yeah i believe not licensed so they won't pay this fee so uh, they'll still have to do the 24 r that cleans it up well, if it's so true. accommodation unit is defined as a separate and distinct living unit, including condominium, townhome, okay. house, trailer, studio, condo unit, or any such similar unit. Yeah. And so, so that is are not paying this. I do not believe they so are. Then, and I, if a hotel, if a if the, if a hotel were to come into another hotel were to come into Breckenridge, does do they is twenty four R applicable to them for offsetting their workforce? Uh, well, it, not if we eliminate it. Well, maybe but we limit we, it to commercial buildings. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, but commercial buildings are, the only one I could, I, be, that's what I just, commercial is a restaurant, right? Yeah, but I mean, maybe we limit it to lo commercial lodging because then they'll, they'll, 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Rick. I, I, see what I don't saying. totally understand why we exempt and get rid of 24 hour. I can see it if it's for a new build of a new build of a unit that's going to have SDRs. In it. Call it a timeshare development, yeah. right? I can understand where we wouldn't because you're that. already for a new start. restaurant that came in. Why wouldn't we? Especially because it's at 35 percent, not at 100 percent. Well, because you're already collecting money to mitigate those employees that they have to hire. But we're only mitigating 35 percent of that money. So you're okay. only asking them to do 35 percent too. I know. So that's only we're only at 70 percent. If the restaurant has to do it, and the, I mean, yeah, I, think yeah, I need to understand it. that more from EPS's because this obviously came from them. When when they come to talk to us, I need to understand that piece more. I don't, I don't totally um, understand. Yeah, where the well, burden, we were, why we the burden for sure isn't. if we were to have them come talk to you. Okay, because they're not. The study is just presented as a backup to the ordinance. Okay. But um, I need to think about this piece. Yeah, yeah I need we... to think about 24 hour quite a bit. The conceptually, you know, yeah. charging exempt at 35%. I mean, right now, 24 hour applies to it, the only thing that's exempted from a residential standpoint is a single family <laughs> duplex, right? right? But any multifamily unit that would be built. Um, would still have a uh, a linkage under there. I guess I also I feel like we need to understand the terms of who this all covers, right? Like I, I don't. If well, this is the exempt, not pretty exempt. much, yeah, yeah. Which which I get, I get that, I'm, and I'm all I'm all for that part. It's just the figuring out. I think it covers everybody that rents for less than but the only days. question yeah the only question i want to confirm is the actual but not typical hotels. hotel or if somebody was a hotel or a bed and breakfast yeah right? yeah those are licensed differently and i think they also are assessed as commercial so um i think we should ask them um if it would make sense to only exempt from policy 24, if they're already going to be having a bolt license for that has this fee. And where does fractional ownership land? Where does fractional ownership land in all this? They have SDR, SDR license, license, so they need a mental license. The only one that I'm not sure is well. Picasso. You're talking about the smaller fraction. Yeah. Yeah. No, they don't come in, they don't come into play at all. Oh. Come into play at all? No. See, but yeah. And I don't think you can at this point. Right. No. Um. Jesus. I can yeah. tell you that the twenty-four hour will be a policy mm -hmm. decision. You're going to have recommendations, and they feel strongly that going back after a restaurant is double dipping. Hmm. Is that your? No, it's creating, Christian? but it's. Cr yeah, I need to think about this one because it's creating the housing for the people who are working there. Yeah, okay. That's why you're collecting the money. Yeah. But housing just so those yeah. people you know, have to give this more. The, the 24 hour piece, I'm going to give a little more thought to. Kirsten? I don't know if I can help the conversation, but I, I mean, the most simplistic way I think about this is if you're pulling an STR license, you will now be imposed both the administrative fee currently, it'll look different, even, you know, we're gonna strike it and pull it out, but you're still gonna be imposed the fee for the staff time. Then an additional fee that this study covers that will pay for the benefits you're receiving for um, housing, and, you know, you're an STR residential or a commercial property owner, you're receiving the benefits of, you know, the ecosystem that supports your uh, renters being here and, and keeping the businesses open. So if, I don't know, I don't have enough information or history on who it, who it applies to, but it will apply to current licensees. Mm -hmm. So if you can get an STR license, then you're gonna have to pay yeah. the fee. Which, yeah, with a couple outliers that I just need, you know, somebody around that can answer yeah. on that license stuff. Um, I mean, Eric, in their their words, this is a much better 
process to look at than having that commercial linkage that you see because that's a very slow doesn't produce a whole lot right. no no it's un understandable yeah and uh so they just feel from us that it you know this locks it down taper you're not going after us uh, nobody could argue you're going after that same employee two different ways. So, mm -hmm. But I understand you're saying you're only getting a part of that. And when we when we did 24 hour, what, year and a half ago, remember uh, like Aspen and Vail and some of them were as high as what, 60, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, mitigation and yeah. we purposely kept it lower. Yeah. yeah, because we were only at like, what, five or six yeah. before that. Right. Huh. Other questions? I mean, it's definitely something for us to think about. I mean, I we would we don't necessarily have to repeal twenty four R at the same time we bring the new one in place, um, but I would want to. I mean, it, it's, before the new one, you know, take goes into effect, that you know, we would if we really want to make sure we're not hitting somebody twice then. But I think what we have to ask EPS, it's not about hitting people twice. It's about missing the business owners completely mm -hmm. because we are going to get all the lodging fine. They're going to all pull bolt licenses, but then someone who's just coming in and opening up a new restaurant will, will never. You're getting, it, you're getting it a different way. Yep. And the business owner doesn't have to pay for it. But some bit but then it makes it so that some business owners are and some business owners aren't. Uh, yeah. Every time an ordinance changes, we that happens. I don't even know, honestly, I don't know that it how much, if anything, even since we enacted it, it's come into play. No, I'm talking Dick, I'm not talking like the old restaurant owners did and now the new restaurant owners don't. I'm talking that the lodging community does have to, but the re the restaurant community wouldn't have to. That's the sum right. too. And some the, all the business owners are benefiting and need employees. Like the need is all around. Right. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about this during the next meeting. Is that right? Well, we're going to we're going to we have we're going to present it to you in work session. That oh. we're we'll taking it to first reading at in an ordinance. Meeting. Okay. In an ordinance. Can we have all these details? like written out in the justification for like the 35% and all of that. Like, I just, it's hard to do this verbally for me, I guess. I don't mm -hmm. know if anybody else is going to find 35% is a policy question that you guys, that's why I'm getting to make sure that you, um, because we need to write that number in. Yeah, we could change it if you decide you want it to be 40%. The reason we went with 35% is because that's the number we settled on in 24 hour that we were gonna require 35% mitigation. And, and um, Aaron, when, when we came up with that number, we looked at data from the other ski towns around the state mm -hmm. with Aspen being at 60 and we were the low at like five at the time. Yeah. And we picked 35% because it seemed to be somewhere in the middle. So that was kind of the history of that number. Right, right. Would it be legal to give it kind of like beforehand, give us a little like a, a cliff note of what you just said and what we've been talking about in the last half hour? Well, yeah, it'll be a memo. That's what. Yeah, know. I mean, bef I mean, before the hand, so before the the memo, before everything, just so we can kind of get a head head around it. It's like, so I don't. Some of these kids, I don't think understand it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm to be honest, I'm a little lost with what you just said. I but, you know, the, I, I understand I mean, the thirty-five percent. I don't blame you. This is a very. I mean, when you do a study like this, Lots. where you're going in, it's a very complicated issue, which is why we hire experts to do it. Yeah. And I honestly, I mean, you can understand the 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 perimeter of, of how they arose uh, uh, arose of where they're at, but I don't think we can challenge it because then we what we can't really debate. I don't want to challenge it. I want to understand yeah, it. I, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then it's a matter of how much of that number that they come up with, or do we want to mitigate saying we're not going to pass that full yeah. thing on to people 
and and who do we pass it on to? Okay, very well. So I'll anxiously yeah. await the memo then. And how does that affect our current policy? Yeah, that's the other part of yeah. you know the one. That's the hard so that's, part for me. Yeah. This is going to be easy meeting. Nothing's yeah, ever. Easy. I feel like twenty four well, hour. Easy. It yeah, felt yeah. like everybody was in yeah. it yeah. together. Yeah. I need to think about it a little more. Okay. Any other questions? No, thanks, Rick. That's helpful because that gives us a lot to think about in the meantime. Anything else? All right. All right. Um, do, you, do you have something you want a definitive answer on right now? <laughs> I'm sorry? Is there something you wanted an answer from the council on? No, this no. Before? I, I think generally you're supportive of the direction, but there are some things you need to understand a little more. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I think we're headed in the right direction. Yeah. And there's a couple answers I don't have that I need to understand too. So and particularly how it relates to 24 hour. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, are we ready for executive session? On acquisitions, you know, do you want to do a couple of reports real quick and knock them out before we go into executive session? And then I think we have plenty of time. Um, yeah, if we want to take 15 yeah. minutes and knock out your reports. Yeah. Why don't we do a report of the town manager and staff? Uh, I don't have anything. <laughs> uh, let's see. I had we had cast and MMC, and I didn't go to cast. So, Carol, do you want to tell us about cast? Yeah, it was great. So it started off with a presentation from the Mountain Town 2030 folks. So that was great to get excited about the event in a year. Um, they did have the White House National Climate Advisor attend through Zoom. So that was just amazing. So we're plotting to see how we can get her to Breck in September. Um, Sweet. Otherwise, a lot of interesting thing. There's a lot of conversation around managing growth, responsible tourism, the wake of COVID, what's happening. Um, one thing that was really interesting, we got to tour Park City's um, deed restricted units that had uh, ADU built in. So that was a really neat concept where the owner can supplement their mortgage with the ADU and um, yeah, provide really more work. Cool. You would never even know it, but they had yeah, separate entrance a, and they had probably maybe 350, 400 square feet tucked in yeah, to like every unit. Really compact design. And yeah. I think it's something that Definitely That's awesome. Here. Um, yeah, that was. Did you drive or did Rick? Shannon drove the entire time. Nice. That means they got there <laughs> yeah. in a timely fashion. <laughs> quickly, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> All of us follow the rule. And... <laughs> good, good conversation. Awesome. Uh, all right, open space. So Carol covered for me, but I have. Oh, you're doing everybody's job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I did cover events, though. So. <laughs> um, so for the staff summary, uh, they're closing out the summer field season and focusing on maintenance. Many of the seasonal staff have moved on to their winter jobs. Forestry projects will likely start next spring or summer for the jointly owned Peabody Placer, as we rejected the bids received this fall for being extraordinarily high. Um, town forestry projects will also kick off next summer once we put out an RFP this coming spring. The quadri, the quadri pilot program for the paid parking in the shuttle will conclude on October 31st. The stakeholder group will meet afterwards to discuss. Uh, wetland mitigation at the Swan River site is moving forward. The town submitted the GoCo grant, which you all know about. Um, and then for the open space and trails discussion, the master plan is wrapping up the local survey on November 1st. Everybody needs to fill this out, um, including all of you. Uh, the open house was a, success with, with, was a success with about 50 people attending. Um, and Anne, I do want to confirm, because I, I believe we've talked about this, right? That they will continue to gather winter information. Yeah, a lot of comments. So the project website that is set up at breckost.com, once this local survey wraps up on November 1st, we're trying to put out new podcasts, which are coming. But we also want to do about weekly 
just one question at a time through that portal. Um, I know, as you mentioned earlier, winter type activities, when it's really um, in winter time is more forefront in people's mind and they have a better concept of kind of what their needs are, what issues they're seeing. And so a lot of those winter type questions we're gonna be addressing on those kind of once a week questions that, that go through the project website. So hopefully we'll still be able to gather a lot of that essential information since our areas are pretty busy in the winter. Thank you. And what's, what is the horseshoe projects? Is that what you said? No. <laughs> no. I don't know what I said. We'll just reread it. It wasn't, well, about the master plan is wrapping up for the locals. I, I, I don't know. I thought you said I wrote it down. Everybody horse. needs to fill it out. No, the Peabody I, Placer? No, never mind. Are we talking about the forestry? <laughs> the quandary? <laughs> no, before Quad quandary. River? Right before quandary. One of the things that I noticed Placer. at our open house was that I they are the same, shoe. we <laughs> are the same people that have been coming there for the last. 10 years to the open houses. There's mm -hmm. no different faces. There's no different. It's all mountain bikers. It's all cross country skiers. It's all people that want the same thing more for the back country. And I don't know if there's a way that we can get people that are interested in fishing or, but it was us. This is basically who was showing up. Yeah, so. we, we've still been trying to get out on the trail and out onto our open spaces and handing out those survey cards just to try and meet people where they are outside especially for those folks who are pretty unlikely to come to a, a public event like that. Um, the Recreation Center was also hosting a Dia de los Muertos um, event last week, trying to really um, bring in the Hispanic community. We also set up a table there trying to get a lot of folks um, to complete the survey, which is available in Spanish as well. Um, as of about a week and a half ago, we'd had about 200 responses so far in the survey. Um, pretty good number so far, but we want to really um, increase those numbers by November 1st, if we can, and definitely trying to reach some of these other communities. So we'll continue to push stuff out on social media as well, because hopefully that's yet another way people can um, find information about the survey. And then we're still trying to have all of our staff carry cards as we're outside, um, out on our open spaces and trails and meet with people that way. Did you, did you send it out to the HOAs that like, some of the bigger HOAs that we, where we know tons of people are living. We, we haven't done any targeted emails that way, just through um, social media. No. I do. I, I'm interested in starting to put more information out that way. I know we have to be super That's careful good. because people yeah. stop reading whatever they're getting yeah. 50 million from Alpine edge. Yeah. But I do think that we're missing a lot of, you know, the residents who are living in workforce housing and we know they're year round. Residents. Yeah, we, we had that great connection when Haley was here to push information out to all the HOAs. And since um, she's gone, I have not um, gotten a hold of those email addresses to push that out. But we can certainly Ian's, try and do that Ian's this week. I'll, I'll send it to Ian and ask him to give it to Alpine Edge and maybe Alpine Edge will just give it to all the people because they have half the, yeah. I mean, we, yeah. you can send it to Ian. Okay. Yeah. Too. Perfect. Or either through Kelly or just straight to him. But yeah. yeah, and I can get it to my HOA too. Okay. okay. Great. We'll do that. It, it was forestry project. Do you oh, know forestry. how um, yeah, the, the Dia de los Muertos event went? Did they that get decent like turnout? Great. Sort of two um, targeted time frames. The morning event was not very um, well attended, but the evening um, session definitely had a lot of people. Um, a lot of people certainly stopped by the table that we had set up for the, the, the survey um, and took cards, and a lot of them said they filled it out. So um, ho hopefully we reached a few people that way. Cool. Um, town uh, BOSAC also recommended funding both the FDRD and the Colorado 14ers again for the town grant program. And then the Swan Mountain Forestry, the yes. Forest Service will be doing forestry efforts and trail reroutes in the Swan Mountain area. BOSAC supported the projects, but wanted to make sure the Forest Service is on top of messaging before the project begins and that they ensure the trail alignments are for multiple users. Cool. And that's going to be a massive project, right? It can start anywhere it from is. a year to 10 years, just how those where it service things. Yeah. I, and I think they're aiming for about five years to have that work done. But again, we want to make sure they get out in front of people before work begins so that um, it's not lost on people when all that work is going to happen. Hmm. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Anne. All right. Uh, tourism? Uh, BTO has a board meeting coming up this Thursday. Mm -hmm. Thursday. 
um, we had just had a board meeting and they were mostly discussing the grants. So, cool. Creative arts. Um, I covered that one. Carol, Carol <laughs> covered for Kelly and I today, uh, yesterday. Whoa. Um, so it's largely <laughs> reviewing finances, also all the partners giving updates on their programs. Um, Backstage had a lot of really successful programs. Um, the Clips is doing well. They have the risk rescue film is starting or is going on yeah. this week. And then a large I thing that was that. discussed is that there is a special purpose tax force being formed within the BCA. Um, on that will be Howard Carver, Wendy Wolf, Jill Desmond, Martin Inglis, and Tamara. And the large um, third task is going to be board development, strategy, and funding. Excellent. Wendy Wolf. On a consultant with that. Anything to add to events? No. Childcare. No, we haven't had a meeting. Workforce outing. We had to cover that last time. All right. And just Mayor Pro Tem report. Yeah, yeah. Carol's been covering that for me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> New pro tem. Uh, social equity. We Carol? have not had a meeting. <laughs> Carol. Other matters? Um, Carol, any other matters? <laughs> I think we should talk about Picasso at some point. Soon. Oh, yes. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I think we need to figure out how to put some sort of a moratorium on that kind of fractional ownership in the neighborhoods. Neighborhood fractional ownership. Yeah. Let's get directed Kristen. at you. Let's get Kristen on that. Yeah. Kirsten. Yeah. Yeah. Kirsten. 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 Whack him no, every I time. Thank you. Yeah, okay. That that matters. <laughs> Any other matters? Kirsten. All right. Let's go to executive <laughs> session. <laughs> uh, script. I move that Thanks, the town Mike. council go into executive session pursuant to paragraph 4A of section 246402 CRS relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest. Residential district. Second. Yeah, motion. Right? Yes. Yes. A motion has been made for the town council to go into an executive session pursuant to paragraph. 4A of section 246402CRS relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest. Subjects of the executive session include land that the town council may have an interest in purchasing roll call. Yes. Mr. Yellow? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Carlton? Yes. Ms. Owens? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Take your mask off.
unmuting. Quiet. It's I'd like to call to order the town council regular meeting for Tuesday, October 26, 2021, at 7 p.m. Roll call, please. Ms. Sade. Here. Mr. Carlton. Here. Mr. Bergeron. Here. Ms. Owens. Here. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Ms. Giello. Here. Mayor Mamula. Here. Uh, approval of the minutes for October 12, 2021. Any uh Anybody want to change what they said, Jeffrey? No, the minutes look pretty good. All right, minutes stand as approved. And oh, agenda. can I go back in time? Yeah, we can always go back. Yeah, we want to go back a couple of meetings. Rick, agenda? Uh, no changes. Uh, all right, before we move on to communications council, tonight is a uh, special night when we say goodbye to um, a guy that has left a mark on this town like nobody else has ever done. Every bit of work that we have done as a council, and I'm talking about every council for the last 35 years, every bit of work that the councils for the town of Breckenridge have done and the planning commission all went through Tim's hand. And there is nothing that we can really say to express the gratitude that I know all of us feel for everything you've done. Thank you. So thank you. It's been, and uh, been the highlight of my professional career, certainly. Um, I feel a strong attachment to this town, more so than Leadville, where I live. <laughs> I probably spent more time here than I yeah. spent. <laughs> it's been a great. The people that I've had the opportunity to work with, both the elected officials and the staff, just made, made it so special. And that's what I'm going to miss. We're gonna miss you, Tim. So, yeah. Thank you. We picked a good replacement, but uh... all right. With that, communications council, citizens' comments. Anyone in the public wish to uh, spend three minutes uh, telling us what they think? Mm -hmm. Sweet. We'll close that and go to the Brett Creative Arts update. Good evening, Tamara Nudzachi Park, Brooke Create. Um, just a couple of three quick points actually for you. Well, four. Uh, I hope that uh, many or any of you were able to join us for Dia de los Muertos on the Arts District campus. We had a lovely celebration of uh, the Mexican culture and the holiday over the weekend and enjoyed several residents and visitors in all kinds of activities. So we hope you stop by and see our um, Calaveras and Mi Ciudad, which is a beautiful ex exhibition of these larger than life skulls painted by uh, a Denver-based artist um, who also did a, a mural in Old Masonic Hall. So please stop by. Uh, and other than that, three quick things. Um, I'm very pleased to report that the Colorado Creative Industries State Board unanimously agreed to recertify us. We go through a recertification process every five years on the Creative District, and they voted unanimously to recertify us without a site visit, which is rare and unusual in this time. So it's just a testament to the investment of the town and every everything that we're doing here in Breckenridge for the arts. Uh, we are, we actually went to their statewide conference and convergence of Colorado Creative Districts earlier this month, and I must say it is truly a pride of the state, what we have here in the center of town. It was used, all of our photos were used as model examples uh, for other communities to emulate. So thank you for that opportunity, and um, we're really looking forward to carrying um, that innovation forward and, and leading us into the next era post-pandemic. Um, we at Breckenridge Creative Arts have established a special purpose task force to really identify, stabilize our organization and uh, do some important work around governance, strategy, and of course, development, which will be a key part 
of our business model moving forward. Um, so we have a wonderful uh, committee, small committee, uh, who is steering that effort. And it is made up of Howard Carver, uh, of just a governance and fundraising professional really uh, enabled us, his leadership really enabled us to raise the money around the air stage. And also Wendy Wolf uh, is participating in that and will bring a great town perspective to that process, as well as Jill Desmond, who is the director of strategy at the Denver Art Museum, who just opened a huge new wing down in the front range. So we have a great group of minds working on that, and we're looking forward to giving you, uh, keeping you posted along the way and getting your feedback along the way. Um, also, the third thing that we are focused on is just uh, establishing a baseline of metrics of uh, performances and key performance ind indicators for our business. So we've created a dashboard um, that tells uh, everyone on the board and our town council representatives where the money goes, where our key investments lie, and um, the gives you a picture of our facility usage on an annual basis, monthly basis, and compares that to our last normal year in 2019. So we hope to really normalize that as a process as we look forward. And once we um, get this special purpose task force off the ground, we'll really have a basis of data to establish our strategy in the long term and uh, hope that everybody participates along the way. I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Question? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Have yeah, a great yeah, evening. Stage. That's great. It's closed. It's snowing. I know, but it was fun while it left. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, one yeah. second reading this evening. It is the second reading of Council Bill Number 28, Series 2021. This is an ordinance amending Chapter 1 of Title 9 of the Breckenridge Town Code, known as the Town of Breckenridge Development Code, and Chapter 2 of Title 9 of the Breckenridge Town Code, known as the Breckenridge Subdivision Standards concerning call-up hearings. Ken. This ordinance, if adopted, will update uh, significantly the Town subdiv Subdivision Ordinance and Development Code with respect to call-up hearings. Uh, there are no changes to the ordinance from first reading. Thank you, Tim. Are there questions of staff? Anyone in the public wish to comment on this second reading this evening? The public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? On second reading, I move past Council Bill number 28, Series 2021, the title of which has been read into the record. Second. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion by Council? No, roll call, please, Helen. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have no first readings this evening. We do have a couple resolutions. The first is resolution number 27, the series 2021. A resolution supporting the grant application for a GoCo community impact grant from the State Board of the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust Fund and the completion of phase one of the Blue River Ref Path extension. I'll take care of this one. Too. Thanks, Tim. Anne's not here at this meeting. Uh, her memo is in the agenda packet. I know she discussed it with the council. It is certainly her recommendation that the resolution be adopted and the town support the grant application. Thank you, Tim. Any questions from the council? Anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution this evening? Public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? A movie passed resolution number 27, series 2021, the title of which has been read into the record. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Manuela. Yes. We have a resolution number 28, series 2021. This is a resolution approving the Colorado Opioids Settlement Memorandum of Understanding. This MOU essentially um, defines how proceeds from the federal litigation uh, covering the uh, litigation against manufacturers and distributors of opioid, opioids. And um, if council has um, any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we're recommending that the town council approve this resolution. Questions? No, anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution? Public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? On resolution, 
I move we pass resolution number 28, series 2021, the title of which has been read into the record. Second. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I'd like to just make one comment. You know, I, I, I think this is something we should pass. I just want to recognize it. You know, we've lost a number of people in our community to opioid overdose and tragically. And uh, $78,000 seems pretty insignificant for the lives lost. Um, I hope that we see more of these type um, settlements in the future. Um, I think this is with the number of people with their hands in the pot, this is probably our best bet and I support it. But uh, I just, we, we can't forget those lives. We can't forget those people. And uh, when, when we get this money, we need to put it to good use. Thanks, Dick. Anyone else? Right. Roll call, please. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we moved to plan. We moved to planning matters and planning commission decisions from the meeting on the 19th. You speak. You uh, speak. I uh, I would like to call up the BGB decision um, based on a few things, but based on the points analysis, um, the points um, analysis of the planning commission. Um, this is a really important project, and I think we need to make sure that we have plenty of time to vet it properly. And um, I saw some areas where I, I think, I, I feel like I need to challenge some of the points. And um, um, for those reasons, I would like to call it up. Thank you, Dick. Anyone else? I'll second that call up. Um, I think we've heard a lot of um, requests from our community to talk about this project more, and we haven't been able to in, in a position that we can. Um, I do question some of the um, points analysis as well, so that's where I would be supporting that. Any further discussion on a call-up? You know, <clears throat> I'm going to vote for this um, just because I think it's, it, you know, it, it doesn't hurt for us to call it up. I don't want this this is the second one we've called up recently, and I don't want this to be perceived as a reflection on our lack of um, uh, confidence in the planning commission. So, you know, yeah, I don't think there's any harm calling it up, but I would acknowledge that probably the planning commission knows more about this stuff than certainly I do. And, but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll vote. I'm going to vote to call it up. Yeah. Anyone else? I just, I, echo Jeffrey's sentiments. I um, do not have the strong feelings, but I always welcome a conversation. So I'm up for it. Agreed. All right. I uh, will probably vote against this and I'll tell you why I, um, especially because there's 10 positive points. I think this is a difficult, uh, you know, maybe there's some points that that can be adjusted. I don't know that any of them are precedent setting. Um, so I would rather discuss this on site specific when it comes to that or let, you know, see what planning commission does then since this is um, at this level. But you know what? It is the, it is the council's um, option to do this. So, you're not, you know, nobody's doing anything wrong. We all have different opinions on it. Uh, and with that, uh, roll call. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. <clears throat> Mayor Manula. No. All right. Uh, it'll be called up and set for the next meeting, which is the 9th of November. 9th of November. All right. Uh, Planning Commission appointments. Mark. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we had a recent vacancy on our planning commission with Christy Matthews Lydell resigning. So we did a recruitment and we had five candidates, narrowed it down to um, 
a recommendation from our interview panel, which included Steve Gerard, myself, and uh, Julie Puster, that George Swintz serve as the new planning commissioner for the remainder of Christie's term, which ends next October. Excellent. Any questions for Mark? No, is there a motion? I move that we uh, pass, put the Schwinz guy on. <laughs> wow. Somebody else want to make that motion? <laughs> George? Hang on. Hang on. I can. I'm, 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 I, mean, I move we appoint George Schwinz. I move that we appoint George Schwinz to October of next year. Planning Commission, uh, to uh, George Schwinz to the Planning Commission until October of next year. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Pretty well. You did. You did. Yeah. A lot Sade. Of yes. Miss Jello. Yes. Miss Owens. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Coon. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, any other other matters this evening? Yes, Tim. Uh, as I party words to the council, <laughs> let me remind you that now you called up the EGD application, and it is such a, a matter of great public interest be real sensitive to ex parte context what are, what's that again don't talk to anybody still can't talk to anybody. about it okay it shouldn't have been before either um you need to disclose it at the time of the hearing yeah All right you can call and talk to staff however yeah. staff is really we view that as they're not a party to the application so if you have a the question you can call the staff and have them walk you through it yeah I want you to go on vacation, fully confident that I'm not going to, to violate any ex parte. Well, it's not vacation. <laughs> He's done. Oh, <laughs> He's not going to be thinking about us at all. Jeffrey's in denial. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> it's a long, long vacation. All right. Anything else for the good of the order this evening? No. We are adjourned. All right.